Good afternoon. I'm David Perdue, chair of the AG Rhodes Board of Trustees. While I wish we could meet today in person, I'm so pleased that AG Rhodes is among the many nonprofit organizations in our community that adapted to these times to continue important events like these. Adapting is an understatement when it comes to the last 11 months on the upheaval this pandemic has brought to our lives and to our communities. And I would argue that no one has been more impacted than the residents who live in long-term care communities and the brave staff members who care for them. COVID-19 has shown us many grim and stark realities, and these realities will forever change aging services. With more than 115 years in operation, AG Rhodes' reputation is built on the strengths of its history, but also on its resolve to improve care for the most vulnerable seniors in our community. And COVID-19 has shown us there is much work to do. We're eager to collaborate with the many aging services advocates, providers, and community leaders who are committed to finding solutions to the systemic issues that have now been thrust to the forefront because of this pandemic. And today's event is one form to facilitate this collaboration as our panelists will address the future of aging and senior living environments post COVID-19. Today's event would not be possible without the AG Rhodes Board of Advisors. Since 2014, the advisors have organized this event to highlight the excellence of care that AG Rhodes provides and to advance the understanding that AG Rhodes is a thought leader on aging. I'm grateful to Joni Tolls, president of the Board of Advisors and all of the advisors who've adapted this year's event so that we could continue to advance important aging related issues. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's event, Jocelyn Dorsey, who will introduce our esteemed panelists. Jocelyn is a former broadcast manager at WSB TV and a current member of our AG Rhodes Board of Advisors. Jocelyn has been the MC for previous Living Well luncheons, as well as MC for a number of Miss AG Rhodes pageants. In recent months, she's continued to volunteer at AG Rhodes in a virtual capacity by hosting several Zoom sessions to discuss current events with our residents. It's truly inspiring how Jocelyn and so many of our volunteers have been able to continue their service in innovative ways, and we're thankful for the technology that enables these opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, Jocelyn Dorsey. Thank you so much, David, for your kind words, and it's my pleasure to be a part of it. I am very honored once again to host this Living Well event, and although it's different this year, we are pleased to have such a great turnout. So thank you all for joining us and your support. I also want to thank and recognize today's sponsors. Without them, it wouldn't have been possible. Our legacy sponsor for today is Unidyne. Our mission sponsors are Georgia Power, Hall Booth Smith, Propel Insurance, and an anonymous AG Rhodes trustee. Our impact sponsors are Accurate Healthcare, Georgia Natural Gas, Progressive Medical Concepts, and Eleven Alive. And an AG Rhodes trustee who wishes to remain anonymous as well is our vision sponsor. We certainly can't thank you enough for making this possible. And for those you have heard mentioned that are commercial entities, please support them. And now I'd like to introduce our four distinguished panelists today. I'm sure you're going to enjoy what they have to say. Bob Kramer is the former is the founder and fellow of Nexus Insights, a thoughtful leadership platform contributing to the transformation of housing and aging services for older adults. Bob is also the co-founder, former CEO, and now strategic advisor at the National Investment Center for Seniors, Housing, and Care. Bob, if you share us just a little bit about your background and also your role. Thanks so much, Jocelyn. I'm delighted to be with you and the esteemed members of uh, this panel today on such an important topic. My role, perhaps, first of all, just background-wise, I've been in this field of seniors, housing, and care and aging services more broadly for more than 35 years. I first got engaged as a state legislator in the early 80s. And I would say my, my role is to bring something of a national perspective as a thought leader and also a bit of an agent provocateur as a reputation I've gained over the years. 
But particularly, I'm excited today about our focus on, it's often said that in a crisis, the role of leaders is to manage the crisis and build the future. Today, we're focusing on what does that building the future look like? So I'm excited to be part of this. Thanks. And thank you. And Becky Kurtz is the director of the Area Agency on Aging, known as the AAAs, and that's for the 10-county metro Atlanta region within the Atlanta Regional Commission. She has also served in other capacities, and Becky, I hope you will mention some of those as well as your role. Thank you, Jocelyn. Really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Um, Yes, as the Area Agency on Aging, or AAA, for Metropolitan Atlanta, we're responsible for providing information about what services are available in the community uh, for people with disabilities and for older adults. And we also fund uh, aging services for tens of thousands of individuals living in their own homes or in their communities. Um, And I invite everyone to check out our website at empowerline.org to know more about that. In addition to this role, which I've been in for about four years, um, I had a long history with um, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. I worked as Georgia's state long-term care ombudsman, as well as at the federal level, leading the program for a number of years. And so I'm very um, interested in the topics we're discussing today from both my current role and my previous role, had a long history, worried about advocating for the well-being of residents in long-term care facilities, as well as individuals living in their own homes and providing those services and supports. So it's exciting to be part of this dialogue. I'm really thrilled that we're looking at not only what's happening, but also looking to the future and what we can learn from, from this pandemic. And we certainly thank you for joining us. And Elise Eplin is well known in the philanthropic community as the founder and principal of the Eplin Group, a consulting firm that specializes in advising philanthropic organizations and nonprofit organizations. But Elise, I know you come to us in a totally different role today. Yes, I do. Jocelyn, thank you so much. I am really pleased to be on this panel representing um, those of us who have loved ones who have been residents at AG Rhodes. I, uh, I'm the daughter of a, of a mother who came to AG Rhodes with late stage Alzheimer's. Um, she passed away in January, but we felt incredibly fortunate that she had the care of the AG Rhodes team. So I'm, I'm pleased to be here and to offer that perspective. And thank you. Our condolences to your family. I know it's a tough time right now. And Dee Cato is the Chief Executive Officer at AG Rhodes. And he really needs no introduction, but he's getting one. Dee, please share your background. Thank you, Jocelyn. And thank you, everyone. I am so delighted um, to be here and, and, and to continue this tradition of our Living Well event. Um, like David said, our organization, I think, knows needs no introduction to the Atlanta market, but we are a three nonprofit nursing home group in the Atlanta metro, Atlanta metro area. Um, in addition to thanking the panelists, Bob, who I've worked with, Becky, who I've worked with and know well, I sincerely want to thank Ms. Eplin, firstly, for just entrusting the care of her loved one to us. Um, in this industry, there is not something that we ever take for granted. So we thank you um, for that and for sharing her with us. I've been with AG Rhodes for about the last 12 years in several different capacities. And today I wanna tell you firsthand about the impact that COVID-19 has had on our facilities. And hopefully on on you learn a little insight into the impact COVID has had on similar um, long-term and senior living communities. Ironically, Jocelyn, today is actually three days from the anniversary of the first case of COVID in a nursing home here in the United States. On the 28th of February last year, the first case was found in a Washington State nursing home. So I think our conversation today is timely, and I'm just happy to share my reflections on it. And I appreciate that. And uh, certainly we're going to have some timely issues to discuss as well. Thank you all for participating. As you realize, our conversation today will address aging and senior living post-COVID-19, but we need to begin with talking about how the pandemic has impacted organizations such as AG Roads. 
Um, we'll get to that in just a moment. But after the discussion, I want to kind of give you the house rules. After the discussion, we will address questions from our viewers. And we encourage you to submit a question at any time by clicking the button under the video window that says, click here to answer, to ask a question. That button will open a form where you can type your question. We will collect them and we will try to answer as many of them during our question and answer session after this. I should also mention there is a virtual guest book and we noticed that some people have signed that. So you can sign the guest book by clicking on the button below your video window again, which says sign our guest book. So thank you so much for being a part of it. First, we'd like to talk, and this is to everybody in the panel, and I want everybody to feel free to jump in because your microphones are open, but to talk about the impact. First, Deke, I'll start with you on the impact of COVID-19 on AG Roads as an organization. Thanks again, Jocelyn. Um, you know, I was, I was speaking with a friend today who, who told me he knows I've had a challenging year, um, and I think the word challenging is just such a gross understatement of what COVID has done um, to our senior living communities. Um, we have been absolutely affected disproportionately. Um, you know, as, as fate would have it, we took care of, and are taking care of the population that is most impacted by COVID. Um, and literally because of the design and the setup of our communities, it was able to, to simply run through our communities like a wildfire. Um, so to some extent, we were sitting ducks um, in this. Um, we have had to change our lives completely um, to implement measures really um, that were aimed at, at making sure that our residents, uh, that seniors that we take care of were safe, um, health and safety measures to limit the spread of the virus. Um, and because of this operationally, we've just been turned completely upside down um, from the restriction of visitors um, in our communities to not being able to do the communal activities that we are accustomed to and the gatherings and, and, and just some of the fun events and the vibrant events mm -hmm. that we've been accustomed to. Um, and essentially for the greater part of our year, we have, have really just had to buckle down. We have had to isolate ourselves and isolate our residents from the public. Um, and then the, the untold, I think, horror of this is what this has done on our staff. Um, I think our staff, people don't realize, have been at significant risk because of, of COVID-19. Um, we said before this, AG Roads had a mantra that our staff was our secret source. Um, and we've seen more than ever. We've always seen them as our essential workers, so to speak, but more so they've stepped up to the place now and they've been our first responders um, through all of this. Um, in spite of this, you know, and in spite of all our efforts, you know, COVID has still been able to infiltrate our homes. You know, once it gets in, once it infiltrates, it's extremely difficult to get it out and keep it out. Um, so to date, we've had 249 resident cases. Um, and prior to me preparing for this presentation, we had 163 staff cases. And while I've been on this call, I got a text that we had one more staff case. So it's 164. Um, and extremely regrettably, extremely sad. Um, you know, I hate reporting these numbers, but I have to in the interest of transparency but it gives us pause each time we say that we lost 26 residents. 26 of our residents died from or because of COVID-19. And one of our staff members as well um, died for or because of COVID-19. Um, so it's been a difficult year. Our leadership, um, our staff has, has have become what I call tactical geniuses. I take my hats off to, to every single one of them. You know, they're dealing now with vaccine distribution and education, with testing, um, over 500 staff on a weekly basis, you know, having to, to, to juggle all of these requirements. Um, and then, you know, really knowing that how this has affected our most vulnerable, our, not just our residents, but those living with dementia. Um, I'll, before I close, I, would, I will tell one quick interesting statistic. Um, at our Wesley Woods community, which has a 50-bed dementia unit in, in that community, all but two of those residents contracted COVID. So COVID has preyed on not just the sick, not just the elderly, but even within those groups, um, it has disproportionately affected many of our residents. Wow. And I imagine it magnifies, Becky, on a, a bigger scale when you look at the 10-county metro area. What are you seeing from that view? 
Right. So the story that Deke just told at AG Rhodes is dozens and dozens of times that, right, in terms of the nursing homes in our region, in terms of personal care homes and assisted living. Um, the services we provide at the Area Agency on Aging tend to be more of people's own homes or private homes. And we've seen uh, issues with the challenges of individuals not wanting the services coming into their home because they didn't want the disease brought into their home, but needing those services to stay, to stay safe and to stay well at home. So how do you um, help individuals get the services they need and not expose them to the virus? It's been a real challenge. And you know, the workforce issue, just like Deke was saying in the nursing homes, um, in the community, the workforce issues is a big challenge too, because individuals don't want to put themselves at risk um, mm -hmm. or they get sick and then they are taken out of the workforce. It's a, It's been a huge challenge. Um, we have found a couple of bright spots that I want to go ahead and mention as positives. And one is that we found amazing generosity from the philanthropic community, and from government, the federal government has provided um, significant funding to bolster aging services during this time, particularly around uh, dealing with food insecurity. We've had a lot of work done around helping people get the food they need because they're afraid to go to the grocery store, um, helping getting, getting food delivered to their homes. And then another thing we've really noticed is a willingness of volunteers to find ways to pitch in, even if they can't do it in person. So one of the things we've started is a um, a one-to-one, -one, we call it, telephone reassurance mm -hmm. matching of volunteers with individuals who are feeling isolated. And that's been very popular. So we found that generosity of spirit in people who want to help and people who want to find a way to contribute. Um, and then, um, again, like Deke said, I'll, I'll uh, echo for the larger community, too, that now we're finding ourselves doing something we've never done before as AAAs, which is partnering with public health to, to strategize around mm -hmm. vaccine access for older adults in the community. So we're stretched lots of ways <laughs> in ways we've never been before. But we've, we've also found it to be an opportunity to make new partners as well. And that's so great that we're hearing such positive things that are coming out of it. And I'm sure our viewers are going to wonder how to get involved mm -hmm. um, if they can. <clears throat> On a personal level, Elise, uh, you know, what has, what has it been like for you and family members personally uh, with your mother having been in the facility? Um, well, uh, um, you know, it was very odd, obviously, not to be able to um, come in, go in and, and see her. And because she had such advanced uh, dementia and she did not die from COVID, um, interestingly, all, all of the the um, the the, uh, the risks that um, of her being in, in um, it, it, having dementia, she did not she did not die from COVID. But um, it, it, at first, it was very odd not to be able to go see her. But the staff was so great about communicating with us in all sorts of ways um, and making themselves available when I'm certain they had no time to deal with individual families. Um, and then as time went on, um, if, uh, if we reached out, they would send us um, pictures or they would help us do FaceTime. And really, mom wasn't aware, um, and that's a blessing in some ways, but just for us to be able to see her her and see, just be able to see her face and see how she was doing. Um, and so we never, we were never very worried about her well-being. And, and that's a really big deal, especially during a pandemic. And um, and that's a credit to A.G. Rhodes. Um, uh, they were very communicative. I was really impressed with the transparency. Deke referenced the losses and the, the uh, people affected. They continued to keep us on a weekly basis posted on what was going on. And that gave us a tremendous amount of comfort that they weren't hiding things and, and that we could trust that they would tell us when if there was some issue with mom. And so without having any um, anything to compare it to, obviously, it, it, you know, I think we couldn't have asked for um, a, a more um, it, comforting kind of experience uh, as, as family members during this time. 
Thank you, Elise. And from the 30,000 foot level, Bob, what are some of the trends that you're seeing with regard to this impact? Well, I, I first of all, the overall impact, I think, has been one. You, It's been a huge toll physically, uh, mentally, emotionally, spiritually on, on uh, the seniors and residents themselves, their family members, caregivers. And it's also a function of many times, uh, and I think especially of the, of the staff here you, and family members, you gear up for a sprint. We didn't know what we didn't know last March. Mm -hmm. And so you gear up for thinking, you say, well, this is going to be really tough. And it was. Mm -hmm. And people were getting COVID and people were dying and people couldn't visit their loved ones. But you're thinking we can do this for two months. But then a sprint became a marathon. And then a marathon seemed to have the finish line as a long distance runner in my past that kept getting shifted. Mm -hmm. And so there seemed to be really no light at the end of the tunnel. At the first, uh, I would say the first four months, the focus was all upon, as it should have been, infection prevention and control. In other words, keeping COVID out, trying to, to isolate and, and do all the things we could to prevent transmission. But then we started to realize the impact of all of that in terms of uh, social isolation and loneliness and people being cut off from family members, being, being cut off from hugs, literally, physical touch. And, and, and that what has a devastate, just as devastating an impact in many ways. And so I would say in the second half of our response, we've been more focused on striking a balance. This, has, this gets into issues I know we'll talk about later, uh, Jocelyn, in terms of visitation, but a balance between safety on the one hand and just people's human need to feel connected. And so I applaud, I mean, Elisa's stories are exciting and encouraging in terms of the staff at AG Roads, but I think we cannot underestimate the, just the degree of sheer exhaustion that's out there right now amongst people at all levels. And, and then I'll, I'll finish this with two positive notes of my own. One is, I think one benefit that's come out of this horrible pandemic has been, it has brought empathy to the issue of social isolation and loneliness for older adults. I now can talk to any college student and for the first time they get it. Mm -hmm. They get it because they miss actually getting together with their friends. And so I find that the 16 year old, the 22 year old, the 45 year old now understand when I talk about social isolation and loneliness and what a bummer that is and literally what a killer that is. Second thing is in the last few days, there have been some uh, really fascinating studies that have been released that have shown right now the greatest drop in new cases and in deaths from COVID is happening where? In nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And that is because of we started early with an aggressive vaccination program. And that vaccination program is now making nursing homes safer than anywhere else in terms of the rate of new cases and the rate of deaths. We all know that was absolutely not true right? Uh, uh, three months ago or six months ago or nine months ago. But mm -hmm. this is the imp impact of the vaccine has been dramatic when you have a focused population where you're trying to get everyone to get the vaccine. So we haven't had everyone take it in those populations, but we've had uh, a high acceptance. And so that's that's encouraging. It's encouraging that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I was just gonna say, thank you for the light at the end of the tunnel. And you gave me a perfect segue because right now in Georgia, um, there's being debate and discussion, quite a bit of discussion on House Bill 290, which was introduced by Representative Ed Sessler of Ackworth. And it's, it's kind of called the right to visit legislation. It's going through, you, you know, we don't know how it's going to come out in the final form because it's gone through some revisions even as we speak, but basically dictating um, how nursing homes should respond to visitation by legal authorities, by 
relatives and family members. And I just wanted to get a sense of, uh, Deke, I'll start with you, especially because this is going to affect you at ground zero mm -hmm. uh, if this passes and what your feeling is about that. Um, I, I think one of the great misnomers of COVID-19 um, and the nursing homes handling of it was that nursing homes did not want visitation to start back or do not want visitation to start back. We were, would be so happy um, to have visitation start back as long as it's monitored and it's done in a safe fashion. Obviously, we don't want to go back to what, what happened in March, but we would love for it. You know, like I said, our staff have been trying to be surrogate families as well as they can, but they have even given us messages. Our CNAs has given us messages to tell um, the, to tell the families that, Hey, you know, we, we want it as well. So we're really looking forward to it. We've been at AG roads doing um, some limited outdoor visitation for quite some time now. And I'll tell you what, that first outdoor visit that we had, was such a touching experience mm. that we immediately know, knew that there's nothing we could do to replace that love and care that a family member has. Um, I would also say that it would be real interesting when the day is done and when all the studies are done um, to see if the social isolation of our residents really made that much more significant an impact on the number of cases in our, in our nursing homes. Mm. I think that would be really interesting. And I think the conduit through open and proper visitation is the vaccinations, which Bob spoke about. Because um, I think if we're able to have um, that success in nursing homes with you know, cutting the cases down, I think a case can be made for at least visitation of family members who are able to be vac vaccinated and then bring, giving them the ability to come and visit their loved ones in our nursing homes. And Becky, uh, from the 10 county metro region, your take on this. Can you hear us, Becky? Well, I'm gonna right. go. To well, um, I have to. I have so many hats I wear on this. I wear that my my work hat, but I also am a family member of a um, of a family member living in long term care, and I also am a former ombudsman. So I come to it from lots of different angles. I will say that. Um, the resident's voice, and we've seen several studies on this now, has been that the loneliness and the isolation has been or more than the... Now, is it me or is, is No, I, I, maybe I'll just jump in. And we've seen that there have been excess deaths for people with dementia that's far higher than it would have been in normal times, not just because of COVID, but others, other things as well. So um, we certainly are sympathetic with the need to open up the visitation safely and the need to provide residents with that opportunity. Great. And Bob, you want to jump in here? Yeah, I would just, I, I, again, we have to strike a balance. It isn't one size fits all. For instance, uh, thank goodness, especially in Georgia, you've got uh, lots of warmer weather days coming your way. So the opportunity to safely do things outdoors, you know, having people uh, indoors in a confined space with, with, with visitors for a long period of time, uh, we may be a while away from that. But being able to visit safely outside, especially mm -hmm. if you know that individual that's come to visit, that family member's been vaccinated. Because that's the biggest favor that family member can do <laughs> to that, to, to that uh, uh, resident, that family member, loved one of theirs. Because even if your loved one, uh, uh, you know, may be in a sense safe, there are others. And we know that infectious diseases spread very easily in this setting. So it's it's so what I would say, I absolutely agree that the impact of loneliness, it is deadly. And we have seen that brought home during this pandemic. That said, we have to strike a balance. And that's why I believe the vaccine is so exciting. Warmer weather coming is also exciting. But I think the, the danger is that um, family members read that oh, nursing homes have had this great success, they've been vaccinated, and then the family member thinks, great, all of us can go, we'll pick all the kids, all our teenagers, let's hop in the car, and let's go visit grandma. 
you know, that's probably A, not going to happen. And B, it would probably be very dangerous if it happened. And so I just, again, we need the opportunity for these lifelines of physical contact and visitation, but we need to strike a balance and we need to trust, in this case, the administration of AG Rose, that they're going to make wise decisions. And I'm always concerned that a law is a straitjacket yeah. and it either goes too much one way or too much the other way. And you got to have flexibility on the ground to see a situation. If you have an outbreak in the building, are you still going, are you going to have the flexibility you need then to control another outbreak? If this is a seasonal virus like the flu. So there are just a lot of things like that, that I think I absolutely, I, I think designating an essential caregiver as one outsider who can continually come in and visit someone. I've been in favor of that for months now. Mm-hmm. But, and but a number I, of states have done that. Absolutely, they have. Yeah. Um, and with precautions, um, because I, I've lived through that where I, ha- you know, I have to be tested and I have to go um, mm-hmm. and be masked and I have to stay six feet apart, but I can visit mm-hmm. in my family member's mm-hmm. room in another state. Mm-hmm. So there are states that have been willing to to go a little bit further than we have so far in Georgia. And mm-hmm. I'm hoping we're we're on the cusp of being a little bit cautious but allowing a little bit more connection until we can get everybody vaccine vaccinated. And I would say personally, um, as an individual living alone, and I'm a senior, um, (laughs) you know, we have to take those same precautions as, and I do mention that uh, as nursing homes do, you know, my son comes in, he's masked. We're hesitant to have the young kids come in because even with the vaccine, seen in the variant strains that are coming in, we mm-hmm. still have to be very, very careful. Mm-hmm. So thank you on that. Switching to another another topic, it's been said that working in a nursing home, and I think uh, DQ had mentioned this, it's probably one of the most dangerous jobs in America other than a hospital. So for many nursing home employees, the wage is less than adequate to support their families and many are forced to assume other jobs to support their families. So how do we realistically begin to adjust the disparities in pay in this industry? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell a little bit of my views, but I'm going to yield a lot of my time to Bob because I think we have an industry leader who can speak to this on a macro level. Um, the issue of pay, I am so happy that it's been brought to the forefront. Um, COVID has expedited a lot of our social issues that we've had, and one of them is, uh, is the pay for these direct caregivers, which should have been addressed a very long time ago. Um, having said that, it's not a simple issue. Um, nursing home pay to a large extent is based on reimbursement um, and reimbursement streams and reimbursement mechanisms. Um, in many nursing homes like ours who take care of the underserved um, populations, you know, 70% of that comes from Medicaid, from state Medicaid systems. And we understand that state Medicaid systems are drained, um, so it's not an easy fix to it. Um, at, on, a, on a personal level, you know, every nursing home I know of has, has paid what we call hero pay during these, these last months, you know, where we incentivize staff who work with COVID residents. Um, I cannot see how we can, after a year, take away that hero pay um, from our, our individuals. And, and AG Rhodes, I'm proud to have a board that is looking openly at this and saying, hey, how can we make this work? And I'm also fortunate to, to run a nonprofit organization that has access to philanthropic funds and capital, but it's not an easy fix. Um, and I'm sure Bobble would, would, would discuss that further. And I know it's not an easy fix. And what I should do is say salute to AG Rhodes because the staff there is long, a long staff. I mean, the, mm. the longevity of the staff yeah. is amazing there. So you've managed mm. to do that well. Bob, mm. your take on that. Well, I think, first of all, we have to take a step back and realize that one hopeful silver lining of this terrible pandemic, it's put a spotlight on something in our society that as a society we've chosen to ignore. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, and it's not only the broader issue of long-term care and frail older adults or frail folks that are disabled, um, but we do not value the skilled nursing setting. Mm-hmm. We do not value 
the people that live there, particularly for whom it is their home. They're not there for a short rehab stay. This is their home. And then lastly, and this gets directly to this issue of wages, we don't value the people that serve the people that live there. And, you know, it's easy to say, pay them more. But as Deke has pointed out, this is a matter of most states, I'm not, I can't comment on Georgia, most states have to subsidize what they lose on Medicaid mm -hmm. with what they make on Medicare, which is the short stay rehab. Mm -hmm. It's a crazy system with perverse incentives, which we won't go into, <laughs> but we need more dollars, but those dollars we need to know are gonna go directly to wages for frontline mm -hmm. caregivers. That's mm -hmm. key. And that's going to also mean on part of the industry, both for-profit and not-for-profit, more transparency about how they use the dollars, how the dollars are spent. I think it's a quid pro quo. The industry wants more dollars. They should have more dollars. But there needs to be transparency how the dollars are spent mm -hmm. and assurance that those dollars are really being spent, in this case, to improve wages and training of frontline staff. And let me say, this is equally a huge issue in, 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 in Becky's wider province with home care and the move to home care and home health care. We're going to need at a minimum 1.5 million caregivers to go into homes. We don't have that workforce. And if we're going to attract that workforce, you know, paying uh, 10, $11 an hour and forcing mm -hmm. people again to work two or three jobs isn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to pay more, then we're, that means we're going to have to change our view as a public that this is the, the value of this. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, I would say is, you know, how much do we value our parents' generation or our grandparents' generation? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it really comes down to society's core values are, are kind of brought out in large, bold relief by this crisis. Because mm -hmm. to be honest, we have grossly underfunded and ignored long-term care in this country. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden COVID happened and the whole sector was put in a glaring spotlight on center stage. And we said, oh, this is terrible. Well, those of us that work in the field have no, known it's been terrible for years. Come on. I mean, it's like we're glad for this opportunity to say, hey, let's, let's do the right thing by the people that live there and the people that work there. And that's just as true in terms of home and community-based services and home care and, and home health care as, as it is the skilled nursing setting. So, and yes, we need to raise wage, wage, wages, but that means higher reimbursement, but targeted to those workers. And, Becky, I think he gave you the segue. <laughs> Uh-oh, I think we've lost Becky. Um, Elise. Jocelyn, I yes, I, I just to add to what Bob is saying, and I do think that um, in this in the spirit of trying to figure out um, how we build better after COVID, um, I think there is better recognition of the value of these caregivers it, it, publicly now. We have a very short attention span as a society, and so we have to take advantage of that now. And and one of the and and to add to what Bob is saying, I also think that there are ways to compensate um, caregivers that are not only wages and and training and and um, job security, but I know AG Rhodes provides scholarships for its um, for 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 many of its uh, staff for their children and for themselves to to get education, um, health care, you know, providing good health care um, to the caregivers is so critical, and and so I think um, those. It, it, some of those things are are ways that a nonprofit can can leverage philanthropic dollars mm -hmm. to do more to to recognize and and value the the mm -hmm. the folks that are really doing the hard work. Mm -hmm. Elise, that is a great point, and let me mm -hmm. just build on that by saying one thing. I think strong culture starts with leaders. I know uh, Deke is a great leader, but leaders care about and are aware of what is what's on the minds of your staff when they come to work and what in a sense is is kind of burdening them fears of their children fear of elderly parents who are at home fear of i can't get uh uh healthy food for my family uh without driving a long distance but and so we've seen wonderfully creative programs 
by uh, senior care providers who are addressing these very basic needs their staff had. They can't solve them, but they can at least say, hey, we're in this with you. We know you're making enormous sacrifices to, to, in a sense, care for our residents as your family. Well, we need to reciprocate by helping care for your family. Mm -hmm. it, it's a quid pro quo. And then with seniors, I would say we're also seeing seniors themselves want to be part of the solution. So what I mean, there are exciting programs in different seniors communities around the country. One uh, here in D.C., they started asking their staff, finding out what they were worried about. They found out they were really worried about their kids not losing key moments in education who were at home. So they said, gee, we're all college graduates. Many of us have masters and PhDs. And they set up an online tutorial program with residents and the kids of staff. The staff were overjoyed, but you don't think that didn't create a sense of strong community. It, it just, it said to the staff, not only management, the residents have our back. So by golly, we're going to have their back. Wow, that was a that's a great idea, mm -hmm. um, and I noticed Elise was taking notes too. But I took mm -hmm. a mental note of that because there are many of us who are available to do those types of things and uh, to see the partnership. And I think it should also mention that we as individuals have uh, a mission to also advocate uh, because we have to advocate with our leaders uh, to make sure that this is a priority. And I'm sure many of us are in the baby boomer category that realize that this hits home and it's very personal. So um, I appreciate that you have given us some great ideas and great suggestions. Um, <clears throat> but now when you look at uh, what do we need to do as we move toward, we, we look at the problems and we see what the issues are, but what are some of the solutions that you would say that you would suggest that we have? And I'd like for anybody to jump in on this one, either from a micro level or a macro level. Well, Becky, if, if, you're, if your mic's working, I'll let yes. you go first. <laughs> okay, great. Um, sorry, sorry for that confusion. I'm in a different location now, so hopefully this will work. Um, yeah, solutions. So let's start. I want to start with the social isolation piece. Mm -hmm. Social isolation was a challenge before COVID. There were studies before COVID that told us that social isolation of older adults was more dangerous than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That was before COVID. Now we know how bad that social isolation is because of the deaths that we're seeing over and above the deaths caused by COVID when people are isolated such an important issue to address. I think now we're understanding the problem. So the first good thing is our society has more appreciation for that issue. The second issue is we're starting to see policymakers saying, and that's something we ought to be able to invest in. And thirdly, I would say as a community, we need to all have a sense of responsibility. And I think we're getting there. I'm hopeful that we're getting there, a sense of responsibility that we can help people stay connected. And ne we need to take the initiative as individuals and as systems to make sure people stay connected. So I'll start with that one and let someone else talk about some others. And then you can come back to me and I'll take another one. <laughs> Great. Going forward in the future, you know, some of the solutions that we might look at at the macro level as well as the micro level. Well, I, I think we've talked about one already, which is funding, but funding directed specifically for frontline staff. I, I agree with, with Deke. I think uh, having given hero pay, hazard pay, whatever we want to call it, suddenly taking that away and pretending that uh, you're not still facing a difficult, challenging job uh, is, is, is uh, well, really unconscionable. But at the same time, we have to realize Many not-for-profits, almost all government entities, veterans, homes, county homes, have gotten out of the skilled nursing long-term care business. Why? Because try as they could, they couldn't stop losing money. And basically, you if you don't have a margin, you end up without a mission. 
And for the nonprofits that remain, they remain usually because they have strong philanthropic support. And that gives them the flexibility to be able to lose money on their long stay residents. So we got to fix that. We got to address that. I want to hit another topic, though, that's important that we've got to raise the bar in terms of prevention uh, and infection prevention and control. No, no doubt about that. That said, a couple of things are important. One, uh, we ha basically have buildings that weren't built for increasingly the residents we're seeing today who are medically complex residents. If they, if they are able to live successfully at home, we need to keep caring for them at home and not in the nursing home. And we need to be able to have through waiver programs, the opportunity for people. There are people still, not as many, but still people in nursing homes. The only reason they're there is because that's the only place government will pay room and board. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be. That should not be. That said, as people live longer, they are living longer with multiple chronic conditions and increased frailty and increased levels of cognitive uh, challenges. And that's going to mean a frailer, more medically complex population. When you couple that with infection prevention and control, you can have an average nurse. I mean, more than half the nursing homes in this country were built more than 40 years ago. 72% were built more than 30 years ago. They were built for a convalescent rest home type setting. And that's not the kind of resident increasingly we're seeing. So I can talk, there's not time, but there, we need some targeted programs that would, in, that would encourage taking these old beds when we have three and four bed wards out of service, put more focus, I would say, on what are called uh, neighborhood uh, models or household models, which have been shown their different staffing patterns to basically have better outcomes in terms of infection prevention and control and lower turnover amongst staff. But the problem is the capital cost of building them. Mm -hmm. And right now, that is the roadblock for project after project to do that. There's no dollars. There's no incentive to build those. Um, and we have I, a certificate of need in Georgia that doesn't allow well, you to build and, and certificate of need <laughs> also takes away the incentive of present operators to innovate, uh, to be blunt. And it's one of our perverse incentives. Then I, want, I just want to close on this note, and that is, we also have to rethink how we think about aging and how we think about residents or uh, uh, folks that need supportive services. We have fallen into what I would call a dependency helplessness model that just views these people as uh, takers, quite frankly, who need care. And we ask questions that while important, are not important to the most important thing to that resident or family member, which is their quality of life. Mm -hmm. Quality, and you know what? We're terrible at measuring that. So we don't even have good measuring that goes on in outside. Skilled nursing has a lot of measures, but I would argue they're all about quality of, of mm -hmm. care. They're not about quality of life. Mm -hmm. And what care, and what do I mean by that? What I mean is. Yes, we're experts at how many chronic conditions do you have? How many prescription and over-the-counter meds do you take? And, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, how many ADL needs and for how many minutes a day do you need? I don't know a person in the world that wants their identity defined by that. We don't ask the most important questions is, what's your aspiration in moving into this community? What do you hope to accomplish? What would you hope to contribute to everyone else in this community? How are ways in which we can help you to achieve some goals you have for your life? We all, we're wired for purpose. Mm -hmm. We take away purpose of residents in long-term care facilities all too often. And so I think thinking about this, rather than having activities directors, we should have purpose matchmakers. And rather than thinking that congregate activities are a function of an all-purpose room, which is the activities in the building, and a van, which is basically means we socialize outside the building, we use the van. Mm -hmm. We need to instead, one of the things COVID has shown us, we can use technology to do all kinds of things to connect people, to provide peace of mind, 
to give them a sense of engagement from their room and to give them a sense of also being able to receive care where they live, not having to be shipped out to the hospital or the doctor's office. All these things in the last year, we've learned they're doable. And, and that's the good news. And the cool thing is, and, and as a member of the Board of Advisors of AG Roads, I see these things happening. What you're talking about are happening at AG Roads. Deke, I'm going to toss it to you because the type of care that's happening there and the transition is actually happening. It, it is. It is. Um, I, I want to be be Bob for a minute. I want to be provocative for a minute. Um, so the one thing I have found in this last year that technology has not been able to do is we have not been able to give care by Zoom. Um, and, and I think that brings the focus back on where it should be on our direct care um, individuals. Um, I, I also see we've started to get some questions coming in. Um, and I, I definitely want to address one because it's, it's directed to um, AG Roads. And the question is about um, the vaccination at AG Roads and, and, and sort of how has that gone? How has that rolled out? Um, so well prior to the vaccines coming, we polled staff and residents and families about their willingness to get um, the vaccine. Um, the, the family and resident poll showed us that about 78% were willing to um, and about 48% of our staff. Um, now, having had the vaccine or the opportunities to get the vaccine, those numbers almost directly match what happened. 80% of our residents got it and about 48, um, and not about exactly 48% of our staff got it. Um, what has happened though, and I know many of you all saw the story this weekend with Ted Koppel on, on CBS that AG Rhodes um, was involved in. Um, I think what has ensued is a lot of, of, of negative, what I call again, villainizing and shaming of staff in long-term care for not getting the vaccine. And I just wanna make it clear, most of our staff have indicated that they will and they are willing to get the vaccine. They are concerned about the safety of the vaccine given the speed with which it was pr produced. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not saying they're not gonna get it. They're just saying, because we were the first to get it, and we literally had two opportunities for them to get it. You get it this day, or you get it that day, or that's it. Um, so I think the issue comes back to availability of the vaccine. I would say proudly that AG Rhodes has um, been accepted as a vaccine clinic. Um, as yet, we have gotten no vaccine, and we hope that we will, because we feel really, really positive. Um, and I saw today our two main trade associations, American Healthcare Association and Leading Age, um, have said that they have put a goal of 75% um, staff willingness to, to take the vaccine by June. And I think we can easily do that. Um, I think the problem was, and, and uh, an Emory doctor, Dr. Manning said it best, we approach the vaccine like used car salesmen, like, you know, hey, you have to buy this car and you have to buy it now. Um, and that approach did not work with our, our, our population. In fact, we probably approach it like a new car salesman. We tried to sell a car, that was a brand new model that have no evidence of being driven before, no safety measures to it, and, and expected staff to be completely willing. I am proud to say I got the vaccine, um, had no problems, no effects. I had both doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, most of our leadership did as well. Um, we have not mandated the vaccine as yet at AG Roads, um, and most um, senior living organizations have not, and that's because the vaccine is still in emergency use authorization. So there are still a lot of unknowns, admittedly, with the vaccine. I hope that that helps that question. And for those that might question about why not mandate it, uh, one of the issues is uh, there's a, there, there is one of the greatest collection of, of, of attorneys is around nursing home incidents. And uh, particularly if you mandate a vaccine for your staff when it's in emergency use, yeah. you can be held liable if indeed they then have an adverse reaction. Yeah, now, there's debate about that, but that yeah. is one of the reasons why many providers have been very, very hesitant uh, about mandating such a program. I would say that nationally, a lot of the stats track what Deke has shared, but what a lot of the experience has been, they didn't want to be the first ones up. But once they saw colleagues getting it and not having adverse reactions, and now, now they're seeing the national news about what an impact it's made on safety 
and declining cases in skilled nursing settings. Mm -hmm. Uh, many people said it's too bad they didn't initially set up three rounds because many people by round two were willing to take the first mm -hmm. shot. Right. But if there was only two shot, if it was a two dose and you had to take the first dose, the first round, then you were knocked out. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and so I, I, there's a lot of optimism. I know the national leaders share your optimism, Deke, that there, we're going to see a much higher take up rate by staff as long as we have more opportunities for, for those shots within uh, the setting. Well, I can't believe that we're almost out of time. Um, I should mention that I had the Moderna vaccine. I've had two doses, mm -hmm. absolutely no issue. I'm three and a half weeks out from the second mm -hmm. dose and I encourage everybody to do it. We have one right. final question. Um, not all nursing homes or assistant living facilities have historically been portrayed very positively, especially during the pandemic. With complaints about lack of communication and information, can you address the need for transparency in the industry as a whole, especially at such a critical time? Well, basically, the industry uh, has had an enormous black eye, and it will only regain trust and credibility are built on a foundation of transparency. If you are not transparent, especially in today's environment, there's going to be assumption that you're hiding something or worse yet, that it, that's a tacit admission of guilt. Mm -hmm. So if, if just like culture, COVID has meant that, you know, uh, just like culture, transparency is no longer an option. You are not going to be trusted if you're not transparent, as Deke was, about cases, deaths, vaccination rates. Uh, how will you handle if there's a flu outbreak six, not nine months from now, after my mom's moved in, how are you, what lessons have you learned that you'll apply differently so my mom won't feel totally isolated? The transparency is, uh, it's table stakes. You will not be successful, nor should you be in this industry if you're not transparent going forward because you won't be trusted. And right now, a lot of trust has been lost. So I, I want to ask I want to ask Elise and Becky to weigh in. AG Rhodes from the start of this has taken the mantra truth, transparency, trust for all the reasons that Bob just said. Um, we need to get rid of that black eye, but the consumers expect it. So, so I would love to hear their view on it as consumers. And we're going to have to be brief on that too. <laughs> I think I said it earlier. I, that was something that, that we were very, my family was very impressed by, the transparency, the willingness to admit when there were things that were hard to talk about happening. And so I think that you guys seem to have really um, embodied that that philosophy of how to um, communicate. So bravo on that. Yeah, and the families need to feel part of the community, right? They need to feel supported and they need to feel trusted with communication, even if it's hard information. It's absolutely critical or, or, or you feel like suspicious, like why are they not telling me what's going on? So yeah. it's absolutely key. Well, and I hate to cut this off. And as you can see, viewers, everyone is so passionate about this. And the topics are well discussed and certainly appreciate the expertise of our panel. Um, and again, uh, we appreciate the fact that I want to wrap up and we were going to have a chance, hopefully, to have everybody to have a quick takeaway. Um, so if we can make it super, super brief, uh, panelists, just one key takeaway, what would it be for you? Let's not forget the lessons. We've all learned lessons painfully. If a year from now we haven't taken action on those lessons, whether it's individually thinking about, gee, that neighbor I have who seems to be virtually a shut in, am I looking in and, and finding ways and finding ways to engage my kids or my grandkids with that neighbor? So all of us can do something, but all of us have to, you know, it, it, this is a community issue. It isn't just an institutional issue or a government issue. So the, the feelings we felt, the lessons we've learned, by golly, let's not, let's make this at least at front, seize the opportunity in this crisis so we can say we learned from it and not be here a year or two from now and say, gee, nothing's different. Thank you so much. Ditto.
That's what I'll say. Ditto. Room for innovation. Becky? Yeah, the, the pandemic has brought long overdue attention to care partners and caregivers, whether those are family members or friends or direct care workers. And I hope we don't squander this opportunity to focus on improving their jobs and their lives and their relationships, because we finally, as a nation, understand how important that is. Deke? And I just echo what everyone said. You know, Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. I think 2020 can be possibly one of the most um, formative years in our development as an industry, because I think it can lead to a lot of the change that needs to happen. Well, thank you. And thank you all for attending. I hope you have enjoyed and learned as much as I have learned from this. I always love to do these because I learned so much. And I do want to recognize once more and thank our sponsors for really helping make this possible. So thank you again to Unidyne, to Georgia Power, to Hall Booth Smith, Propel Insurance, Accurate Healthcare, Georgia Natural Gas, Progressive Medical Concepts, 11 Alive, and Our Trust. Your support has helped make this event possible, and we appreciate all you do to advance the mission of AG Roads. Hopefully next year, we'll be able to see each other in person. And until then, I wish you all good health, happiness, stay safe, and advocate for seniors. Thank you.